pray for KBC and the new pastor the Lord leads to you. And then it says, just the right thing, just the right time, just the right way. Thank you. God bless Pastor Crystal, Lauren, and Joshua. All right. So we'll turn it down. Now, we've been doing um, a series here on future events or a kind of a study of last things, and we've covered quite a bit of information. Um, we've gone through the covenants. Uh, we've talked about the millennial kingdom and the reign of Christ. And my intention was to move into the tribulation period today, but I'm going to hold off on that for just one week because there's one, um, one theme I really want to kind of address uh, before we get there. And that theme is the kingdom of God. And we are Kingdom Baptist Church. And so today I want to just talk a little bit um, about the kingdom of God. Today's message will be probably a little bit shorter than some of the others. I know I have kept you guys here uh, for quite a while on the last few, um, and I won't, uh, I probably won't throw out as much information. But um, as we go through this series, I want to remind everybody that our messages are available on Facebook and YouTube, so you can always go back and watch. As we go through this series, we're going to be building on things, and there will be building blocks, so it may be difficult um, to jump right in, it may be helpful to, to go back and see some of these earlier steps and stages uh, in this process. And one other thing I did want to mention before I start, um, and I'll forget if I don't say it now, is Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, we're back here in the church um, for Wednesday nights. Amen, yes. Um, and we are doing a study with uh, Andy Stanley right now, and it is, uh, it's really good. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Andy Stanley but uh, he's a really, really great preacher and teacher. This is something that's not just good for Christians, but even unbelievers can come, um, you know, or your friends and neighbors that may not be saved. Uh, he speaks to them, too, and he tells you, you know, e you know, even if you're not a Christian, and even if you don't believe the Bible, these principles will still help you. And uh, he's talking about guardrails and putting up those barriers in life to keep you from ending up in shipwreck. And it's been, it, it was a really good first study. Um, so anyway, if you can be here on Wednesday night, um, that would be really good. Um, so anyway, we'll leave with that. So the kingdom of God. So there was a pastor of a church, and he declared to the church that we are kingdom people, and we must invest in doing the work of the kingdom. And the congregation heard that, and they said, amen, and they nodded. Okay? But a few weeks earlier, he had preached on the millennial kingdom and the coming kingdom of Christ. So... <coughs> There may have been an apparent contradiction in that because first we are a kingdom and the kingdom exists and we're a kingdom people and then uh, we have this kingdom that's not yet come yet. So how, does, how do you reconcile that? And so some questions um, came up and these are questions that we should all be asking, by the way, whenever we study the Bible, we need to be asking questions. And so the first one is, is the kingdom present or something future? Is the kingdom on earth? Or is it in heaven? The answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> and we'll get to that. And, and I'm going to flesh this out a little bit as well. All right. So, uh, you know, like many people, uh, you know, and, and, and me included, because there's a lot to this that, you know, it can never completely be understood, or at least not until we get to the heaven and, and the Lord reveals more to us. Um, we've all learned, and, and many congregations have learned, to just deal with the fact that there are some, um, you know, things that, that are not really clear, an unclear concept. And the kingdom of God is one of the great themes of the Bible. God is the eternal king. He rules now and through all eternity. And it's in his kingdom that all of his purposes will be fulfilled. And since the kingdom of God is such an important concept, in all views, when we're talking about future things in general, but even beyond that, just in our basic theology, right, it's, it's important as well. It would be important to define the term in the way that the scriptures use it, okay? Now, the kingdom of God is a scriptural term or scriptural phrase, for sure. Um, so, therefore, we must take time to thoroughly study the Bible to get a proper definition of what this is. Now, <coughs> The kingdom of God is really an abstract concept. You know, we like things to be black and white. We like things to be red or green, okay? But this is actually a very abstract concept that has a lot of moving parts and a lot of components to it. Um, <coughs> so the Bible teaches us that, and we must be aware 
that any ver I mean any view that's based on one or two verses needs to be viewed with skepticism, by the way. Okay? Any view that's based on one or two verses needs to be viewed with some sort of skepticism. Okay? Because the Bible has a lot to say about it. And we must be aware um, <coughs> that uh, the starting point for studying the kingdom of God is looking at the Bible. So, I'll give you an example here. If we were to base our entire understanding of the kingdom of God on uh, Luke chapter 17, 21, let me go ahead and look at that, we would be aiming for trouble. You can just begin in 20. It says, uh, it says, now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to him, the kingdom of God does not come with, obser uh, with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, if we based our entire theology on the kingdom of God or we built a doctrine on the kingdom of God, which, by the way, I will tell you, there's a lot of books out there talking about the kingdom of God and telling you a lot of things about the kingdom of God, they need to have a balanced view through the whole scripture. And whenever we study the kingdom of God, we need to understand which aspects of it these verses are talking about. When we get into depth uh, or in-depth study of the Bible, we really need to be looking at the text and asking the questions of these things. So to get a better picture, we're going to look at some scripture today. And by the way, the Bible talks about this divine kingdom and mentions it over 200 times in the scripture. So we're definitely not going to have time <laughs> to look at all of those. But we should be able to look at enough verses and enough things today to just get a better basic understanding of some of the distinctions of the kingdom of God. So first off, whenever you're speaking of a kingdom, there's a few things you have to have, right? First, you have to have a dominion or a physical sphere to rule, and that is ruled by a ruler. You have to have some sort of people or subjects that are to be ruled in a territory where the rule takes place. Now, in the kingdom of God, we have a sovereign ruler, and the ruler we have is God, okay? Now, there's going to be multiple aspects as we, as we talk about this today, so bear with me. Some things may seem like a contradiction in the beginning, but as you understand and we look at this, we're going to see that they're not contradictions, but rather they're just different pictures of a great big abstract view of this kingdom that is made up of a lot of components and a lot of uh, aspects. So, the ruler must have authority and power to rule. In the biblical concept of the kingdom of God, God is the ruler. King Jehoshaphat says it in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. And he says... And Jehoshaphat, I'm going to start in verse 5, stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Right? So King Jehoshaphat here recognizes the sovereignty of God over all in all the universe. This is something um, that's not just expressed here, but taught throughout the Bible. And this continues uh, from the beginning all the way to Revelation. So the question of rulership over the earth is eventually settled once and for all, as we saw and we've been talking about in our, uh, not only the millennial kingdom, but the eternal state of that future uh, kingdom. And then John mentions the throne of God more than 30 times. And when I talked about thrones, we've already kind of discussed this, but remember, when we hear the word throne of God or we think of throne, we're not talking about just an ornate chair. We're talking about authority, ruling authority. That's what a throne is. So a kingdom must have a ruler who has the authority to rule, and that is our Lord God. And in the realm and exercising of that authority in the kingdom of God, God exercises his rule over the heavens and over the earth. As a matter of fact, in our scripture reading today, we saw Jesus was given all authority and power, right? Matthew 28, 18. So these things are mentioned by David in 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. Since we're in Chronicles, we'll go ahead and look at that. 29, 11 through 12. And David says here, Therefore David blessed the Lord. I'm starting in verse 10 and all the assembly. And David, David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and on er uh, sorry, and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, excuse me, in your hand it is to make uh, great and to give strength to all. So David mentions these, this idea, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about a universal kingdom because there is the universal aspect to this kingdom of God. But there's also going to be other aspects we'll get to in a moment, okay? And, um, you know, we'll have the spiritual aspect of this kingdom and some of the others. But first, I want to talk about some distinctions, just some different distinctions. All right, when coming to an understanding of the kingdom of God, certain distinctions need to be noted, okay? At first, some may seem like they contradict. Okay, at first glance, but this is not the case. We're looking at an amazingly wonderful abstract concept here. Okay, so first we look at some passages teach that this kingdom it has always existed, right? Psalm ten sixteen. Psalm ten sixteen. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of this land. Right? And then look at uh, Psalm 145, 13. And he says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your, in, in your dominion endures throughout all generations. Right. So we have some of these passages that teach about this, this eternal state of this kingdom. And then others teach as though there is a beginning to this kingdom in the future. Look at Daniel 2.44. We've looked at this in our previous study as well. And if you remember, the context there is the statue um, with all of the different kingdoms. And remember, the rock comes and destroys the statue. And this is what it says, Daniel 2.44, it says, In the days of these kings, um, of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, so we're talking looks like yet future here, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be uh, left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Okay? Now the Psalms teach us that the Lord is the ruler over an everlasting kingdom. Jesus told his disciples to pray for the kingdom to come. Right? And Daniel gave prophecy about a day when the kingdom would begin that's not presently in existence. So one of the ways to distinguish between these kingdoms or to distinguish between these aspects here or, or distinctions is to note whether the kingdom has a starting point or not. The Bible speaks of the kingdom as being a present reality. And, uh, <clears throat> and some verses speak of it not starting till the future, as we saw. So, for example, the psalmist uh, of the Lord uh, speaks of that the Lord is presently ruling as king in 29.10. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever right but then if we look over at Zechariah 14 9 Zechariah 14 9 and it says and the Lord shall be king over all the earth uh, in that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one right so, and then we also saw that Daniel spoke of that day when the Son of Man would rule over all the kingdoms after they were destroyed. So <clears throat> this is the first distinction here. So we have this uh, beginning of a kingdom and an eternal kingdom. And then we have the distinction of the scope of the kingdom of God. Sometimes the uh, Bible speaks of uh, the kingdom as being universal in its scope. Okay, And, uh, and sometimes... Um, <clears throat> you know, in other words, there's absolutely nothing outside of the kingdom, right? Psalm 103.9. Psalm 
um, 103.9, and it says, I'm sorry, 103.19, forgive me. And it says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So there's absolutely nothing outside of this kingdom. But on the other hand, the kingdom is also revealed as earthly in its scope. When God establishes his kingdom, it will encompass the whole earth. And Christ will rule from his throne in Jerusalem. And we just looked at Zechariah 14.9 there. Um, but uh, also, if you um, want to dig more into this, Isaiah 24 has some things to say about it. 24.23 to be specific. And then we have the administration of the kingdom. The administration is how God administers or the administration of his kingdom. And the kingdom is sometimes presented as ruled directly by God. Right? With no human mediator ruling on God's behalf. God administers his own rule over any or all parts of creation, right? Look at Psalm 59, 13. Psalm 59, 13. And he says, consume them in wrath, consume them that they may not, uh, that they may not be, and let them know that the, God of, uh, that the God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth, right? Now, this is in contrast to Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm. And I will read that to you. And I'll just begin in verse 1. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves up, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. I will declare uh, the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for an inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So Messiah is obviously that mediator who will rule over the nations of the kingdom of, of kingdoms of earth. And he stands in God's place since he's identified by God as my king, right? So God can rule directly, whereas he exercises his rule directly. And then there's also indirectly where he rules through people or uses people, right? And these are different distinctions, um, not contradictions at all. But the Bible's giving us a bigger picture, as I said, of uh, what the scripture is revealing about these different aspects of God. So before we continue... Um, and we're going to get into these various aspects of the kingdom. But before we continue, I want to talk uh, really quick about a phrase that's used in Matthew. If you've ever heard, the, and maybe you've heard it taught before, but there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Have you ever heard that before? Well, actually, the, the, the two terms are really synonymous, and you can find that um, if you study through Matthew 13 and then look at Mark 4 and Mark 8, and you can see. So the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are, are, are synonymous terms, but you have to understand that when Matthew was writing um, his gospel, he was writing to a Jewish audience. And you understand that one of the things about uh, his Jewish audience and, and the Jewish um, religion is they were very worried about taking the Lord's name in vain. That was a big deal. So Matthew um, went to lengths to kind of um, write to the Jewish sensitivities that he knew uh, were there, and so instead of saying the kingdom of God, he uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, but they are the, the same thing, um, and it's best to understand it that way. Um, obviously, Mark, you know, he wrote his gospel to the Romans, and Luke wrote his gospel to the Greeks, and you can kind of see that in how they, how they wrote. So now I want to talk really quick about the various aspects of this kingdom, okay? So as we discuss God's rule over creation, there's some different aspects that become obvious as we study this through. And, we'll, and, and we need to distinguish these. Now, when I say aspects, I might say the term the universal kingdom. I might say the spiritual kingdom. I'm not talking about separate kingdoms. I'm talking about aspects of one kingdom that is the kingdom of God. But these are some, some different uh, we're going to look at here. So the context in which the kingdom is being discussed, okay, so whenever you're studying, always look at context. How many times have I stressed that context, 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 will help you to understand which aspect of the kingdom that the text is talking about. When somebody's teaching you, always take everything they say back to the word of God and make sure um, that it lines up. So first is the universal kingdom of God or the universal aspect of the kingdom of God. And this is the rule of God over the entire universe. In this aspect of the kingdom, nothing happens outside God's will. And as we already looked at, and we saw that in Psalm 145, 13, 
God's control is eternal, okay? And this rule is usually direct, and sometimes it's evidenced through supernatural manifestations. Exodus 11.9, we'll give you an example here. Exodus 11.9, it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the um, children of Israel go out of his land. But he also rules indirectly through individuals, right? He rules indirectly through individuals. Look at Proverbs 21.1. Proverbs 21, 1, it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of the water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And then you can look at Isaiah 10, 5 through 6. And he says, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff um, <coughs> in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down uh, like the mire of the streets. Right? So he also rules through individuals. And then sometimes he rules through elements of nature. Exodus 14, 21. This is a familiar one here. Exodus 14, 21. He says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind um, all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters uh, were a wall to them um, on their right hand and on their left. Right? Now this aspect, when we talk about the universal aspect of the kingdom, this is the broadest aspect of it. Okay, his eternal sovereign rule is everywhere over every created being over everywhere in in, in the entire creation. Okay, then the Bible speaks of this spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. And this is the rule of God over all those who are believers. Okay, those who have experienced the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Look at Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13, he says here, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Okay? So we have the spiritual aspect of the kingdom, and uh, that's those who have been through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot to the spiritual aspect, a lot more than we can know and understand, obviously. I mean, this aspect of the kingdom gives us citizenship in heaven. I mean, there, there's, there's an amazing amount in this. And then Jesus also spoke about this spiritual aspect of the kingdom when he spoke to Nicodemus. You guys remember he went and met with Nicodemus? And look at John 3, 1 through 10, and he talks about this. I'll just read it to you here. It says, there was a man uh, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's natural birth, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit uh, is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. And then Nicodemus answers and says to him, uh, now, can these things? How can these things be? And Jesus said, uh, "Are you uh, are you a teacher? Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things?" Right, so we have this 
um, aspect of the the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about it there. Um, and now this this aspect here um, includes the church. Obviously, all true believers are a part of that, but it also includes the Old Testament saints as well. Um, and it will continue on until after the rapture takes place. And this is the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Okay. And then there's another aspect the Bible talks about, and there's a, it's a big word. It's called theocratic, but it's really just the rule of God, right? And when I say that, what I'm talking about is not specifically the rule of God over everything because he does uh, do that. I'm talking about ruling over a human kingdom, which he, de- which he did, by the way, um, more specifically in Israel during a period of time, okay? And that was during the time of the Mosaic Covenant. We discussed a little bit about the Mosaic Covenant. We understand that. Um, That was given on Mount Sinai. But if you notice, um, that kingdom was established on Mount Sinai when Israel entered into that covenant relationship with God. And what did they agree to do? They agreed to keep the law, right? And after leaving Mount Sinai, they went and possessed Canaan. And Joshua was leading them, right? And then after Joshua, God did not establish uh, another direct human leader like that. It was God's intention to rule the nation through priests, right? But what happened after about 300 years? What did Israel say? We want a king, right? We want a king. And what did God say to him? God God says, well, you're not going to like it, but if you want a king, (laughs) you can have it, right? So God gives them kings, and and then you have a period of time where the kings are God's mediator um, there, and God is ruling through these kings. Now, if you understand, and I don't want to dig too deep into history, but you understand that after Solomon, his son Rehoboam, uh, had a little conflict there and with a guy named Jeroboam, and Jeroboam uh, took ten and a half tribes and went north, and he divided the kingdom, okay, the, the kingdom of, I- of Israel there, and it became split. We call it the divided kingdom. So you, you, Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south, right? So when you read uh, the Bible and you hear the Bible talking about Israel and Judah, Sometimes they're talking about the two different uh, parts of that uh, particular kingdom. Obviously, the northern kingdom had set up, uh, Jeroboam had set up, um, you know, golden calf and some other things. So there was a lot of problems in the northern kingdom, and then they were judged first, right? God used the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in, took off the northern kingdom. They never came back, right? But then um, the southern kingdom, um, they lasted a little bit longer under their kings, Uh, They had a couple of good kings. Remember, all the kings in the north were bad. They were all bad kings. Uh, The south, uh, the southern kingdom had a couple of of good kings in there. Um, (coughs) And so they lasted a little bit longer, but ultimately they failed. And so God judged them and he used Babylon, uh, who came in and took them captive. And ultimately they ended up returning to the land, but their kingdom was put on hold at that point. So God used in this, this theocratic kingdom, God used his human administrators Um, But we can see that that time period ended um, because the Shekinah glory departed from the temple. That must have been a really sad thing. But um, the Shekinah glory, when you when you hear that term, that was symbolic with the presence of God. Um, And obviously that was in the temple. But uh, and and we're not going to read it now because there's several passages dealing with it. Um, So I'm going to give you these passages here if you want to just jot them down. But. Um, Ezekiel 8.4, Ezekiel 9.3, Ezekiel 10.4, Ezekiel 10.18, and Ezekiel 11.22, and then also the entire chapter of Ezekiel 23. So when this aspect of the kingdom ended... The focus and attention was on the future when Messiah would come and rule over the kingdom of David, right? Or the kingdom promised to David. And then we have this other aspect of the kingdom. It's called the mystery aspect of the kingdom. And and these names aren't exclusive. There's some, some different names they use for them. But the mystery aspect of the kingdom... And let me explain what a mystery is. I, I think I explained it before, but um, a mystery, when the Bible talks, uh, uses the word mystery, it's talking about something that was not yet revealed. So remember when we talked about the mystery of the church, Paul said the church was a mystery, okay? That was something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. So it was completely unrevealed. That's why nobody saw the church age in the Old Testament because God didn't reveal it. He said it was a mystery. And so here we have another mystery, things that were not revealed um, 
before, but Jesus actually uh, reveals a lot about this mystery form of the kingdom, and that's in Matthew 13. And we could just turn there, but I'm not going to really, um, you know, read through it all. There's a lot. You can go back and kind of read through some of this on your own. I'm just covering the basic aspects of this um, kingdoms, but we find a lot in Matthew 13 as Jesus talks about this. And I'm just going to start in verse 11 here because, or, or verse 10, the disciples asked Jesus why he's speaking in parables, right? Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answers and he says uh, to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Uh, and, he who will, uh, and he who will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, uh, nor do they understand. Anyway, Jesus goes through here, and he, he tells some different parables, a couple uh, big ones there. Um, you know, the parable of the wheat and the tares is also included in this mystery of the kingdom. And you can find that in uh, verses 24 through 30. And then Jesus gives the um, explanation of that parable there in, in verse 37 and so on. He said, the field is the world, or I'm sorry, he who sows the seed is the son of man, um, the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So we have this explanation um, here as well. But there's some other parables that you'll find in there too um, about the devil, you know, stealing the seed, which is the word of God um, as well. So he talks about this mystery, this mystery aspect to the kingdom. And this really encompasses from Jesus' first coming to his second coming, okay? His first coming to his second coming. We can see that in his parables, and it includes more than just the church, okay? While the church is a part of it, that there's more than just the church, obviously, because we see the wheat and the tares in there as well, right? So we have unbelievers also as part of this mystery um, aspect to the kingdom. And so the Old Testament was missing that. Um, but it falls between the period of the first and second coming, and it's different from that spiritual aspect uh, because we have those unbelievers in there as well. And then we have the millennial kingdom of God. The Bible talks about this millennial kingdom, um, which is an aspect that we've discussed. But uh, so I'm not really going to I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about this millennial kingdom because we've already really done that in the rest of our study. But this is a kingdom that will be set up and ruled by God for a thousand years. But um, <coughs> Jesus will sit on the uh, throne of David. Right. We talked about that. God's covenant promises will be fulfilled. The Abrahamic covenant, the, uh, God's covenant with David, the land covenant, all of that will be fulfilled in that millennial kingdom. Okay, um, And Jesus will actually literally physically rule in that kingdom after he comes back. And then we have the eternal kingdom. And really, the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom are kind of connected. And that's why uh, we can see, when we see in the Bible, it talks about a kingdom that is said to last for a thousand years. And then it says, it also says it's, it's to endure forever. And uh, so really, there, there are two parts to this, this kingdom. The millennial kingdom, obviously, is here on earth. The eternal kingdom is when God brings in the new heaven and the new earth. And we looked at that last week in Revelation 19 and 20. And we saw that Jesus comes back. He sets up that kingdom. He rules for a thousand years. During that time, the devil is bound, right? He's put in the abyss, and he's bound for that thousand years. And then at the end of that thousand years, what happens to the devil? He's loosed for a short period of time. He's allowed to go out and deceive the nations. Um, obviously, they try to rise up against the Lord and his kingdom, and then that's it, and that's, that's the end of it. Then you have uh, the devil being judged, and you have the white throne judgment, and then the new heaven and the new earth come, and we move into that aspect of the kingdom. So that's really the second phase of the millennial kingdom, um, and that's why the kingdom is said to last for a thousand years and endure forever. Okay. The second phase is the eternal state in which God reigns over a new heaven and a new earth, a new earth that is free from all opposition to his rule. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it'll be as it was when he created the universe in the very beginning. Okay. So one thing to make clear, though, is that once the Lord returns and establishes kingdom, and that's the millennial kingdom, once he returns and establishes that, there will never be another human kingdom that will rise up and have power and authority. Jesus will rule over it all. And... Um, 
Now, he will use human mediators. We saw that, right? When we looked at the millennial kingdom last week, we saw that Jesus promised his apostles that they would have a place in ruling the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, right? So you get this picture of the millennial kingdom, and the apostles will have jurisdictions there where they'll be ruling over and judging this, um, the 12 tribes of Israel. And even the Gentiles um, ha- may have a place in that as well, where they're given uh, the ability to rule and such over some of the Gentile nations. But ruling is all under the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the absolute ruler in all of that. All right. And then um, Paul talks about these two phases, as a matter of fact, uh, of the future eternal kingdom in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. So let's look at that really quick. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. He said, but each one... Uh, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, okay, uh, and he's talking about, um, for as Adam all die, I'm starting 22, for Adam, as, as Adam all die, even so in Christ it shall be, ma- uh, shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he uh, puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about these two phases here. He teaches that in verse 24 there, that uh, Jesus at the end of the millennial reign delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, right? Delivers up the kingdom to God the Father. And then in 25, 26, Jesus does this after putting an end to every enemy, including rebellious man, evil angels, and even death is put to an end there. And Jesus' enemies, that that phrase there, um, when it talks about enemies will be put under the feet, uh, that's, that's actually an ancient kind of phrase or figure of speech. And what it means is it is the total defeat and subjugation of one's enemies. Okay, the total defeat and subjugation of one's enemies. So the dominion that Adam lost in the fall will be fully recovered by Christ. When this occurs, Christ will turn over the kingdom to the Father for eternal reign in a new heaven and a new earth. And what God had originally intended for creation will come to pass. Okay, now... If you're me, you ask questions. You say, well, who's going to be ruling in that eternal kingdom, right? Is it the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? And uh, I don't have an answer for that, but (coughs) there's some differing opinions out there, but the one I think is best is uh, Christ will continue to reign because his reign is eternal, according to Revelation 11, 15, um, but uh, he will reign with the Father in the Trinitarian glory, right? So I think we'll have all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reigning in that. Now, those are the different aspects um, that are, are kind of revealed here, just some of them. There's, there's so much, uh, it's really hard to get into all of it. But um, now I want to speak for just a moment about the church and the kingdom of God, okay? Because the church and the kingdom of God are actually two different things. Now, the church is part of the kingdom of God, but these terms are not synonymous, okay? This is one of those things that sometimes you'll read or sometimes you'll hear, that the church and the kingdom of God are synonymous. And as we've seen, there's several aspects of this kingdom that the church is, is, may not be necessarily a part of, although they're a part of a lot of it. So you look a little further um, into it, and you see um, that some, if you try to, use, when we go back to the beginning, when we try to take that one verse and use that to explain the kingdom of God or to teach the kingdom of God, um, there's a lot more that needs to be explained because there's a lot of distinctions in there. But, um, <coughs> but I do want to say that... Uh, this doesn't, the church and the kingdom of God are not synonymous, but it's not that, that doesn't deny the fact that the, that the church is part of the kingdom of God, absolutely. So the church is part of the universal kingdom, right, because it's under all authority and control and all of creation when we talk about that. So it's under that aspect. The church is the spiritual kingdom of God in this present age, right? Um but it will exist uh, after the rapture and, and even some before. Um, but it had no part in that theocratic kingdom or that when God was uh, ruling over Israel. Okay, the church was not a part of that. Okay. 
The church is part of the mystery form of the kingdom because this form exists between the two comings of Christ, and we saw that um, aspect as well, but we also see that unbelievers are a part of that aspect. And then the church also uh, has a, a, a final place in the future aspects of the kingdom, right? And the church is going to have a prominent place, by the way, in the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom because you know who we are? We're the bride of Christ. Amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. And uh, we'll talk more about this next week when we start talking about events in the tribulation period. But the church is going to be raptured. We're going to go up to be with the Lord. Okay? We'll have the judgment seat of Christ. We'll receive our rewards. And then we'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's, that's really exciting. And then we'll come back with the Lord to establish and, and set up this kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and move into the future state. So a lot of wonderful, wonderful things to look forward to. What a wonderful future we have um, as children of God. We've been redeemed, and we should anticipate being a part of that eternal kingdom. And it should affect how we live our lives right now, by the way, because that's going to affect our future. These truths should motivate us to represent our king in an excellent way especially in a hostile environment and hostile territory. And we should be awaiting expectantly for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to come back. Amen. All right. So I told you I'd keep it a little bit shorter today. Um, in the next, uh, the next uh, study, we'll, we'll really dig into 